Hello, everyone, and welcome to this very important media webinar, which takes place a short while after COP26 has taken place. And in a year where we heard an enormous amount about net zero pledges by various countries, industrialized countries, and followed by developing countries and emerging economies. So we as journalists covering the climate situation and the climate pledges and the climate negotiations around the world, when we looked at these all these net zero pledges, there was one thing that all of us pointed out, that the roadmap of governments on how to get to this net zero seems very, very unsure, seems very vague, and seems very opaque, at least to us at this time. So there was this, I won't say demand, but there was this request from journalists all over that, okay, what is going to be the roadmap? What are we going to do? And that is why we chose this particular theme for this webinar, which is being jointly organized by the Third Pole, the Earth Journalism Network, and Lights On. So the theme is what should the governments be doing in 2022 in terms of climate action. And that is exactly how we are going to do it. Before we start, I am just requesting all our participants who have joined this webinar, welcome to all of you. Please put your questions in the Q&A box. That's the box where which all panelists will be looking at. And that's the box from which they are going to be taking your questions. We'll keep this as interactive as we possibly can. We'll try our best to keep this totally interactive and so that your questions can be answered. If you have questions specifically for any panelist, then say so. If it's for generally, then say that. Having said this, I'm not going to spend any more time. I'm going to start by asking Dr. Atik Rahman, the co-chair of Climate Action Network South Asia, among many other things, what he thinks Bangladesh government is planning to do in terms of climate action in 2022 and what, according to him, the Bangladesh government should be doing. Thank you very much. Um, Bangladesh government has been quite open, progressive and interactive in terms of decision for um, uh, climate action because um, the uh, scientific community here uh, is interacting closely with the international scientific community and uh, the NGOs are quite strong, civil society groups and research community is pretty strong and the government is, uh, has various committees in which all most of these people are brought in into discussion of uh, developing the national policy. So I would call it um, progressive with this. Of course, government has the last word. They can decide on how to craft the language, but often it's a language that comes from committees uh, to, to, to decide. As for the action themselves, um, Bangladesh perceives climate disaster as a sort of genuine uh, threat and entry, entry point. So whatever, uh, and Bangladesh is often visited by a large number of disasters, whether they're cyclones, floods, even droughts in the north, and some uh, you know, land erosion and river erosion. These are all part of uh, the climate hydrology uh, you know, interaction and sediments from all over the Himalayan region comes to the rivers of Bang Bangladesh. There are three major river systems, the Ganges, the Brahmaputra, uh, and the, um, what is also called Jamuna, and the uh, uh, Meghna. So all these three river systems coming from three sides of India, Assam area, 
Meghalaya, all that area plus Himalayas, Nepal, Bhutan, and then Sikkim, and all those parts. They, however, the river transverses parts of many states of India, but ends up through Bangladesh into the Bay of Bengal through the big Magna estuary where all these rivers meet. So it's a big flow of um, water as well as sediments that come down. Uh, so this is the water laden area and um, the nature of rainfall is such that if there is a, the system is prepared for a certain amount of rainfall, which is huge, because this is the, you know, Cherapunji, the highest rainfall area is just above it, Himalaya is very close, etc. So it's like Himalaya rapid fall and the plains of Bengal Delta. Uh, uh, is, is the way this is dominantly defined. Now, and there's a huge amount of water and sediment that passes through it. Um, the sediment load is something to the order of 2.4 billion tons per year. So it's a you know, uh, mind boggling number. So given all that, uh, there is little that individuals can do with this mighty river and they have their own flow characteristic but uh, the ordinary farmers they need the water and a little amount of flooding to uh, wet their soil but a bit too much is flood a bit too little is drought so this is oscillates around a uh, a line of uh, equilibrium, which historically and hydrologically over the decades and centuries have been settling in. But nonetheless, uh, the population is growing rapidly. So the demand on the land is enormous. Um, three crops per land per year uh, is normal, normal uh, behavior now, which used to be initially one 50 years ago, initially two, to the, 25, 20 years ago, and now three crops. And in between those also on the edges and everywhere, other crops are being done. And uh, it's very fertile land because of the sediments that come from the Himalayas uh, replenish the fertility of the soil. So we have um, the general picture where uh, food self-sufficiency is one of the national targets. And that's what the government make sure that full set subsufficient there. We have more or less achieved that with respect to the main um, uh, carbohydrate crop rice. Rice is the main feed for the population. Wheat is also increasingly entering the main food, food um, agenda uh, for carbohydrates. And this is being produced in the North Bangladesh, et cetera. So we are having uh, more or less oscillating around the mean of self-sufficiency. If there's a little decrease, then there is shortage and um, little increase can enter the international market. So it's very difficult to predict and hold it exactly there. But nonetheless, between the production system, the farmers, the government, and the various NGOs and others who are working, it is a quite a, a supplementary and complementary system where government is, of course, the final word and the leader in terms of decision, because they can take decision from one geographical area to another geographical area if these uh, replacements or adjustments are needed in an area or intercrop uh, changes or shifts. Ordinary people, farmers cannot do that. Farmers will choose what is they know best and what is the best growth in their, their area. And they have a uh, annual budget, how, what they are willing to spend in terms of fertilizer, water, etc. So that is the overall um, equilibrium. Uh, food self-sufficiency in rice is pretty much there, though we might have to, the government does buy some for stocking, so any, any eventualities or any crisis. Uh, that is more or less on the carbohydrate. We have got legumes. Uh, various lentils and legumes for giving um, land-based uh, uh, protein to the poor. These are poor man's protein 
And because we have huge number of rivers, still the numbers of fish is decreasing, but um, more recently government has made some policies to uh, even in the natural system to stimulate those, get more fish, but and restrict the period in which uh, fish, um, many of the calves uh, below six inches cannot be caught, etc. Some regulatory processes are taking place, conservation processes are in place. Uh, overall, uh, the story is not dismal. It is much better than what we used to have before. Better management, uh, private sector is coming in in a big way. Uh, government, private sector, NGOs, civil society, local government, all that is working quite closely on these issues. And these are central issues to the government in terms of um, uh, social crisis that that government is, um, doesn't want to initiate and wants people to be uh, satisfied. So multiple cropping, uh, intensification of river um, uh, protein. Then there is a lot more uh, marine protein, which is catching in the Bay of Bengal. In the, we have about a um, uh, 200, about 300 kilometer uh, continental shelf, which is slowly uh, going deep down and uh, good for fishing. So uh, there are a lot of traditional fishermen by generations. They are fishing people in the, um, they know the um, pulse of the ocean very well. They are the Bay, uh, Bay of Bengal. So they know when to go and when to come back. Though these they when there are cyclones and warnings, um, we get tragic news of some people gets missing some boats don't return, et cetera. So hazards are still there. The telecommunication and the internet, well, not so much internet, but telecommunication has improved. So they are in touch. But um, if there is a real crisis in the deep ocean, then there's not much one can do. There are both big ship uh, helping them uh, in those areas. So overall, things are getting better. People are getting more um, fish in the market. They are getting so uh, the price is increasing. That is a pricing is a different uh, area of decision making, and and uh, not in the hands of either the farmers or the fishers or the poor people. So, but overall, I think the total amount of carbohydrate input has increased per unit per capita per plate, and total amount of protein also has increased. There is of course. Uh, animal uh, supplementary vegetable protein from various vegetation and um, Bangladesh being a very fertile land, the, every village woman has their own little uh, village plot of uh, growing whether whatever uh, vegetables they are more accustomed with. So um, that is visible. Uh, winter is a particularly good time for winter vegetable fresh and, and uh, people here want to eat fresh food frozen is the, um, I would say that bad habit or the, uh, of the luxury of the rich, but uh, poor people are onto the everyday fishing market in the villages and the uh, vegetable market. They, they bring their own product from home into the village. So um, overall it's still, uh, you might call it primitive in that sense. Uh, market is taking over, but uh, supply system is still domestic in its character commercial, big commercial. Let me stop there just to say that um, the, the, the threat of starvation isn't there. That is the big news for uh, the people of Bangladesh. The threat for bad water. Uh, of course, we are not yet in a position to give safe drinking water to all, though hand pumps help across the country. And um, there are other ways in which NGOs and other organizations are helping. We have created um, rainwater harvesting as ways of keeping drinking water in the coastal area, which are saline, um, uh, threatened by salinity, et cetera. And salinity is increasing, there is no question. We know the salinity line, which is now going into the communities and affecting people. Uh, let me stop there. I can go on for a little longer, but it's not needed. I think we have made points to make it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Atik. That, no, that's very useful. What I'm taking away from there is that the immediate plan is to improve the climate adaptation 
for farmers, for fishers, and especially for um, water, water supply uh, and early warning systems for fishers, especially in the sea. That's what I'm taking away from, uh, yeah. from what- let me, let me just, in terms of your bullets, let me try to say that our um, uh, forecast and uh, prediction on weather events and extreme weather events is pretty good. People trust it now. There was a time they would not trust. Now, in the last 10, 15 years, it has improved tremendously. It has people believe in it, and they, they have. And for extreme events like cyclone, there uh, we have enough. Well, not may not be enough, but we have adequate shelters for people to go to. But uh, we, as NGOs, our, um, our civil society groups, are talking to the people and asking the government that rather than people going to shelters, bring the shelters to the people. So make them, you know, village based. So they don't have to travel too much under difficult circumstances. So those are the refinement yeah. in policies. But uh, the good news is that the number of mortality deaths have decreased significantly near zero. You know, right now, uh, tens would be considered a large number. There was a time when thousands would die from such events. That came to hundreds and now to tens or less than that to unions. And people are concerned. So mortality has been managed, but morbidity, the the loss of crop, the loss of uh, food, um, uh, inundation, uh, many of these, and health issues, uh, illness, uh, diarrheal diseases, all those are still set, and uh, people are trying to handle in the best way. But the system is reasonably well connected uh, with the government infrastructure and supplemented by uh, civil society, NGO, local community, wherever there is. And uh, the legal elected government system of um, uh, local level governance is taking root. So it is getting better that way. There are issues of some leakages here and there, and that, that's all part of uh, that life that we have to accept, I think, for the time being. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. I'm going to move to Central Asia. I'm going to uh, move to Olha uh, because she, like others, has a very large area to cover in this webinar. Uh, she, o Ola Boyko is the in charge of Central Asia for Climate Action Network. Uh, and she is looking at all the CIS countries and all the other Central Asian countries as part of a job. Uh, and my first question to you, Ola, is given the variety of countries you deal with, do they have or even should they have similar plans for climate action in the coming year? Thank you, Georgie, very much. Hello, everybody. It's very nice to be here in such company. Um, first, let me, uh, if you allow me to um, correct you a little bit, uh, it's the Climate Action Network of Eastern Europe, Caucasus, and Central Asia. So oh. it's actually even more countries. <laughs> it's 11 countries of the post-Soviet uh, region, basically. And from the Central Asia, I will uh, quickly walk you through some of the bullet points that I've prepared. Um, if you don't mind, uh, including the countries um, that I will cover. So we are also part of the CAN, Global CAN Network, um, as the Dr. Atik as well. And I have been a coordinator of this uh, regional network for more than two years. Um, I will be happy to share this afterwards with you because there are some interesting insights that uh, you might get when you have more time uh, from, for example, our vision or the climate policy review that we did last year and plan on continue doing uh, probably starting next year, so one in two years. But this is an overview of all those 11 countries, including Central Asia. 
Um, and we also did uh, research uh, last year um, for the People's Voices and National Climate Plans. Basically, what are the mechanisms for the civil society to participate in climate policy? And it actually also includes Philippines, um, but from our region, it was Kyrgyzstan that was, um, that was analyzed. Um, and then we have some, some social media, but we mostly use the Russian language, so it might not be very applicable. And let me introduce you to the region itself. So. Um, it actually includes five countries. Sometimes the Caucasus countries are also included. Sometimes Afghanistan is included, depends on like who you ask, depends on what kind of uh, project it's part of, for example, et cetera. But uh, for us, it's, uh, it's five countries. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any members in Turkmenistan, so I will not, not be able to cover that. Um, but for like other four countries, uh, I have a, uh, an overview and, um, um, a good idea of uh, what's going on and what what to expect uh, next year. Also, some important um, basic information for you is that uh, all of these four countries, uh, uh, yes, four countries, uh, five combined, produce less than two percent of global greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, they are, in fact, highly vulnerable to climate crisis uh, in 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 different um, in different uh, uh, spheres. Um, there are glaciers, uh, there is drought as well, so uh, the water problem is a very, um, is a very important one. And uh, there is also a very uh, diverse but difficult political situation uh, still after the Soviet Union, so there are governments that are very closed, uh, there are countries where the civil society has complete, like, has no voice um, and is not able to influence um, anything. Um, and then there are countries where the situation is a bit better. So I will tell you just in, again, bullet points about um, each of those four countries where we have actually members that work on the ground. And I will start with the biggest uh, one, Kazakhstan, uh, which actually uh, didn't update its NDC since 2016. So they only have their first submission. Um, and of course, uh, a lot of countries that um, have, uh, um, um, have been in the Soviet Union and in the 90s they uh, kind of became independent. Um, the emissions actually went really down. Uh, you might know this because there were there were a lot of industries that closed and basically it was because of the um, industrial uh, changes. It wasn't because of the ambitious climate policy, but in fact, a lot of emissions went down from our region. Um, for example, I'm from Ukraine and we have our emissions like 65% down compared to 1990. So we're already kind of ahead of, of the EU in this case, you know. Uh, but also what we do and what our countries do is that they use the 1990 as the base year in order to appear more ambitious. So they compare the percentage to the 1990s, forgetting to actually say how much they've already saved um, compared to that year. Uh, so this is, you know, a general occurrence. Uh, however, a year ago, uh, President of Kazakhstan has announced they want to be climate neutral by 2060. And during this year, we've seen a lot of um, um, a lot of high level, uh, I would say, appearance uh, like on the international um, platforms and a lot of um, good targets, good words said, you know, but of course, like we need to wait and see um, whether those actually have any anything behind them. But Kazakhstan is definitely um, more aware of um, the international climate policy um, platforms and that the fact that they need to be present there and they need to commit to something, you know. So they did, um, and they are right now in the process of accepting actually this, uh, it was called the low carbon strategy. Right now it's like strategy for climate neutrality, but it's the same, it's the same document. Um, and they actually have in this document that they will be stop, stopping using coal by 2050. Um, I mean, which is not the, the ideal, but it's, it's interesting that uh, it seems like a, in a very um, um, subtle manner, they have announced kind of a date uh, of phasing out coal. However, they, they did not make such like a very big focus on it because they are still dependent on coal. There are regions who are very dependent on coal and they need, um, and they need to, to make to do it step by step. So they cannot, I think, 
uh, on the national level, on the international level, say that they will stop using coal right now because this will cause a lot of uh, criticism from the regions and from, from the coal regions. So what we expect is actually an uh, updated NDC finally, because it's about time after the five years of uh, not updating it. And of course, the uh, climate neutrality strategy that is being developed right now, there needs to be a concrete action plan. So we understand how actually they're going to achieve that, um, uh, lowering the amount of coal they use, et cetera, um, what's going to happen to the regions that depend on coal right now, um, and uh, connecting to, again, this, uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, this industry is the potential new just transition projects. And I see a lot of interest towards Kazakhstan in this regard. And there actually might be some, some joint projects with other Asian countries. Um, but we really need to focus and uh, uh, I want to say control um, the, the aspect of the civil society participation and local level participation, because it's impossible to create any kind of just transition strategy um, without consulting, like a, a good one, without consulting with the people who actually are in this industry, within the industry, without consulting with the civil society, uh, because otherwise it's going to be just on paper. And so we really need to pay attention to that because I see that this might be happening next years and the government might be able, might be interested to participate. And uh, I see a lot of co cooperation, actually, as I said, Kazakhstan has, understands that they need to be present, they need to be, you know, their voice needs to be heard on the international platforms, they've participated in COP as well, um, they actually co-financed the first ever Central Asian Pavilion, which was present during this COP in Glasgow, I don't know if you've seen it, if you've been there, but um, this was the first time that Central Asia actually had their own pavilion, and I hope this will continue. So I, I, I see that there might be more cooperation with other countries that we already did some like high level dialogues with Ukraine and Kazakhstan, because Ukraine also announced the climate neutrality to 2060. Uh, of course, Russia uh, cannot be avoided in, in, in case of uh, relations with, with Kazakhstan. Uh, a lot of interest towards Germany, potentially for just transition projects, maybe Asia, as I, as I mentioned. So let's move on to Kyrgyzstan. Um, and this is actually a very interesting case for me, especially because um, they are quite, um, I would say, ambitious um, compared to other countries of Central Asia. Um, and their emissions is like ridiculously small. So they are mostly focused on the vulnerability part, on adaptation in, in what they're planning. However, the coal is also being used and um, it's very like the the people actually are using this uh, to heat their houses. So this is a big problem for the households. Um, yes, and uh, they did update the, the, the NDC. Um, there were actually uh, processes, uh, mostly coordinated by civil society organizations that did um, consultations with the regions. So within the NDC project uh, process, within the NDC process, uh, our members, they like gathered uh, comments, gathered information and uh, thoughts from the local communities and then passed it to the um, committees that were developing the NDC. Uh, of course, the, ideally, it shouldn't be all, you know, like um, uh, task for the civil society organizations. Ideally, this should be thought through within the process itself, but um, it still happened. Um, and they did kind of committed to climate neutrality till 2050 during COP very cautiously. So it's not right now in any official documents, as far as I know, um, but they did mention it. Uh, and I would call this year like a wave of commitments, of course, for climate neutrality, which did not um, um, avoid our region as well. So we have some new commitments for that as well. Um, as I said, they are a highly vulnerable country. They emit around 5.5 million tons of CO2 equivalent per year. Um, and again, it's like a third of what they've emitted in 1990. So it's already uh, lower. Um, and I've written strong civil society because in fact, we have uh, 
a diverse membership in Kyrgyzstan. Um, we have a lot of strong organizations that have been working for many years um, on different topics. So it's not like you only have this one organization that is able to do something. It's actually quite diverse. And uh, I think that this will help um, with, the, with the development of the country as well. Um, so what we expect is actually this new NDC's implementation, uh, the action plan and uh, understanding what's gonna happen on the local level. Um, we actually see that there will be more action on the international level because also Kyrgyzstan uh, took part in this COP and they've been um, actually consulting with civil society before going and there were a lot of people in the delegation who went for the first time and did not know what to expect. There are a lot of people who are new uh, in the ministries uh, because of the um, political disturbances again. Um, there are a lot of new people and they do not know what to expect uh, when, when they are being sent <laughs> to conferences like this. And it's really good that they've actually uh, went uh, to consult with the civil society experts who have been going and have been um, following uh, the conferences. Um, and uh, yeah, so I expect that they will be more present during the next COP. Hopefully we'll participate in more discussions, more decision-making processes. Um, and uh, yes, uh, hopefully, as I mentioned, because burning coal at home and uh, using it for heating is a big problem. Um, I hope that more studies on alternatives will be made. And uh, again, probably by civil society organizations, but maybe not only, uh, of like renewable energy alternatives for, for actually for this. And um, the last point is that uh, is something that we've actually, kind of advocated for during COP is for Kyrgyzstan to join Climate Vulnerable Forum, which I think would be a really good idea of like getting um, around uh, similar organizations, uh, similar, similar countries who are also vulnerable and who are actually raising their voices together. And I think for Kyrgyzstan, it would be a good company uh, to join. And um, two countries uh, more. So Tajikistan uh, also updated the NDC. It also leads to rising emissions uh, on paper uh, because it compares to 1990 again. And here we have a really um, weak civil society presence and influence, unfortunately. So it's, it's quite closed and uh, working as a civil society, as a registered civil society organization is quite difficult. You need to fill in uh, an insane amount of papers and, and reports. Um, however, the country is very vulnerable to climate change, especially with the water uh, problem, as I mentioned. And uh, uh, instead, they, uh, in, in the official communication, they always say that uh, they will focus on renewable energy, they will try to make their energy sector more clean, while only focusing on hydropower. So this is a very dangerous um, uh, situation, because they already are... Um, lacking water. Um, so what we expect from Tajikistan basically is um, probably more action on the local level. There are a lot of um, um, communities that live far, far from the city, far from any kind of electrical lines. They live in, in, in small villages and um, they even might not be having access to coal to heat their houses. They gather some kind of crops and they, you know, and so uh, other members, for example, they work with these um, communities uh, in, in the mountains and they bring some um, energy efficient technologies to them, solar concentrators, etc. So they can actually, um, so they don't need to go away for a few hours a day to gather something, you know, to, to burn them and have a heating. Um, and so hopefully this, this work will continue and we will see more communities that are maybe even independent in terms of where they get the energy. Um, uh, yes, uh, I, there are a lot of initiatives right now, a lot of um, yeah, kind of a good signs from the Central Asian as a, Central Asia as a region. So as I, as I mentioned, there was a pavilion, they've prepared a position from the governments, a joint one. So they are trying to act as a, um, as a joint force kind of. And hopefully Tajikistan will join this, um, um, yeah, this, uh, this, uh, this unity. And uh, maybe this will help actually if, like the country itself 
um, to see what are the ways that other countries are dealing with these problems, etc. So find some kind of um, support um, by, by engaging on the regional level, um, on the level of Central Asia. And um, definitely there will be some projects from the international donors and, and, and this is also like the basis for a lot of, uh, a lot of what's happening. A lot of kind of like climate policy is based and dependent on the international support. Um, there's a low, cap low capacity for the, like the government funding uh, for these kind of things for now. Um, so I, I expect that uh, Tajikistan will continue having this uh, support and, and getting um, funding for, for projects. And we will try to follow as much as we can on in regards to the civil society participation, of course, because um, this will definitely be um, uh, a topic to follow. And last but not least, Uzbekistan, uh, again, a very interesting country. Um, they have updated the RNDC as well. Uh, I've read it and it actually has some good uh, content in it. Uh, there are plans uh, or like suggestions uh, that uh, introducing carbon tax will be a good idea. And just for you to understand, we only have carbon tax from all of these 11 countries that I've uh, mentioned from Eastern Europe, Caucasus and Central Asia, carbon tax only exists in Ukraine and it's super low. Uh, it's like 0 0.3 uh, euro cents per ton or something like that. So it's, it's ridiculous. Um, but there are already a lot of uh, discussion on the national level as well in Kazakhstan um, on, on actually introducing this uh, financial mechanism. So as well in Uzbekistan, it, it is present in the NDC. Um, there is, again, difficulties for civil society to, to work, to function, to be registered, to try to influence processes. Uh, they have really heavily relied on gas because they have a lot of it and uh, they are exporting it. So uh, it's probably not uh, in the near future that they will uh, turn away from it. And of course, a lot of what is coming kind of we have a member there and they're always trying to cover these stories uh, about the RLC catastrophe. So again, the water issues are very present there. Um, and the water issues in Central Asia in general, uh, I think you understand, they are cross-border. So it's also, it's a kind of a both sides. So on the one hand, it can be a, a, a reason to for dialogue, a reason to cooperate between countries. On the other hand, it might be a reason for conflict and it, it has happened already in the past. So what we expect from, from Uzbekistan is of course the NDC implementation and we will follow whether there are any processes for civil society to be included and heard. Um, there are a lot of uh, journalists uh, trying to uh, kind of raise their capacity and write independently about what is happening. So this kind of, this kind of it's not a civil society uh, like campaigners and activists necessarily, but journalism is also part of activism in, in this regard. So this is something that we're also looking into. Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully there will be a higher interest next year for the financial mechanisms in climate policy, like monitoring your verification of, of um, greenhouse gases, uh, like the emission trading system, like the uh, carbon tax, as I mentioned. So we'll see about that. Definitely a higher interest from all of the governments of Central Asia towards the climate policy, towards financial mechanism, towards where they can participate, um, how they can improve and secure basically their own economies. And of course, it's, it's, uh, it's usually coming from a place of economical development rather than uh, understanding the deep reasons of climate change, et cetera. Um, but this is what we work with. And our role as well is to ensure that civil society is present and that there is an independent uh, media being able to write about this and uh, that's actually, yeah, the countries are doing what they, um, what they are promising to do. Um, so this will be all for me. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, I will be glad to answer any of your questions probably after, or if there's time uh, right now. Uh, thank you very much. Right. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Ola. That, that was very useful. Uh, excellent information about an area about which no, we know far too little. We need to know a lot more about this area because it's such a crucial part of the world. Uh, I'm going to move across the mountains to the southern side of the mountains to my friend Manjit Dhakal of Climate Analytics. And my question to you, Manjit, is 
what is Nepal going to do in terms of climate action in 2022? And what do you want Nepal to do? Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you, Zaydeep, and uh, to all the distinguished panelists. Um, the, the year 2022 will be crucial for Nepal, as well as many other uh, countries around the world, but those who are facing the blunt of climate change, um, also to, to understand the, the impacts that are, that are growing uh, rapidly uh, to, to build resilience uh, in, in, in our respective countries and then to implement the sustainable solutions. Um, on, on all this front, uh, when we are talking about the climate action, uh, Nepal, including Bangladesh and, and Laos, um, are also marching towards the graduation pathway. Uh, the, the formal graduation will take place uh, after five years in 2026. The decision has been taken. Uh, for Nepal, uh, this is going to happen um, for the first time that the country uh, will be graduated without meeting the income criteria, uh, which is positive in a sense that uh, it is not only the, the economic progress that matters, which we can link uh, to, the, to the whole debate on the climate change, uh, but also a lot of other qualitative indicators uh, that are important for the overall uh, prosperity of the country. Um, however, there is also a challenge uh, to, to retain uh, that status of graduation um, because of the extreme economic and the climate change vulnerability that the country is facing um, and, and, and the progress made on, on all this front. So the year 2022 uh, specific for Nepal will be, will be very important to prepare for the smooth transition uh, for graduation while addressing the compounding crisis uh, that the country has faced uh, in terms of COVID, in terms of uh, climate in this disaster uh, that, that we see, that we hear in news every day. Uh, in, in terms of the, the, the vision, the, the country has taken much of the, the leadership position in the re recent years, uh, rather than the, the vulnerable perspective. Uh, I'll explain that uh, in, in detail. Uh, we, we believe in limiting the global temperature rise to, to, to 1.5 degree and much lower uh, because uh, even if the global average temperature is limited to 1.5 degree, uh, the report uh, at the regional level uh, by ECMOD has confirmed that uh, more than one third of the glaciers will, will melt, which will have an impact in the whole region. Um, and uh, so, so this, this common agreement reached uh, at, at the global level in terms of 1.5 degree is also much higher uh, in, in our case. Uh, there are there are also priority uh, related to the, the financing climate action and particularly building resilience uh, and, uh, and, and, and the loss and damage remains priority because the way we have seen the, uh, the way the global emissions are, are not on the right track in terms of what science has advised. Uh, so this clearly shows that the loss and damage will be important for Nepal as well as countries in the region. Uh, specific to Nepal, uh, this is the country uh, in terms of the, the the, the length and, and even drops of the breadth of the country from north to south. Uh, it extends from a 70 meter from the sea level to the highest peak of the world at 1848.86 meter, the new edition. So, so in this in this small, like about 180 kilometer from north to south, we, we see these rains where there is the highest peak of the world, mountains, uh, Himalayas, uh, hills, valleys, and then also the plain area. Um, so it's, it's, it's very difficult for a country like Nepal to devise any, any kind of uh, solution uh, to, 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 to face to, to all this kind of climate induced disaster. Uh, in, a, in, in this small, like 180 kilometer range, we have to plan for, uh, to, 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 to face with the climate impacts that, that, that happen at the mountain, climate impacts, uh, the landslide that we face in the, in the hill region, the flood that we face in the plain area, and, and the in the melting of the glaciers that we we face in the, in the high mountains, so that 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 again that also links with the with the huge amount of resources that are required uh, to to face these kind of challenges, and also the the, the institutions and the infrastructure at the country level, uh, which uh, the one fights one 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 size fits solution doesn't work uh, at, at, the, at the at the country level. We hear this discussion uh, always when we discuss about the solution at the global level. But, but in, this, uh, in, the, in the one country, it's difficult for us to have any, any kind of one-size-fits solution. Uh, we, just one, one, one small example, a month ago when the, 
when the official uh, declaration was made in terms of the, the monsoon season, the rainfall has ended. A week after that, there was a huge rainfall, uh, which has a huge impact on the, and the farmers who were harvesting their rice, a paddy field. Uh, and, and, and this relates to what Atik sir was saying earlier in terms of the, 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 the weather forecasting. Uh, we, we also have a very strong system in terms of weather forecasting. But what we realized at that time was, yes, we have a system, we have a strong system at the, at the central level, but, but we still need to do much to translate those information to the ground, particularly to the farmers uh, at the ground. If, if that information, and, and, and personally, when I, when I observe the whole situation, the Department of Hydrology and Metrology has made the forecasting in terms of rainfall. Uh, but but we we failed to take that information to the ground. So I think this 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 there are also a few uh, this kind of initiatives to be taken. Uh, as I said earlier, the country has taken much of the leadership position in the recent years, uh, rather than only talking about the vulnerability that the country is facing. The the the, the prime minister's statement uh, in the recent world leader summit at COP twenty six was different in a sense that uh, it emphasized on Nepal's contribution. Um, instead of only sharing the expectations uh, uh, to, to others, uh, the message was clear that if a country like Nepal, uh, with, with one of the smallest contribution to the global emission uh, and with very limited capacity, uh, can take ambitious action, then why not others? Uh, in, 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 in that sense, uh, in our updated NDC recently, uh, we have uh, the country has included the quantitative GHG greenhouse gas emission reduction target on the on the energy sector as well as many activity based target in all the other major sectors. Uh, for the first time, the country has also included uh, a financial contribution um, to to implement uh, the action implementing the NDC, the the, the total costing. Uh, required to implement the NDC for next 10 years is, is around 28 billion US, US dollar, uh, where the country has also uh, confirmed to, to, to mobilize a domestic resources of around 3, bill, 3 billion uh, US dollar. So, so this also gives a message that, that we, we, despite of having the low emission and low capacity, we want to be a part of solution uh, to, to, to resolve this problem. But the, the role of the the, the international community in terms of providing resources to the developing countries and particularly the least developed country like Nepal is very important uh, because the development finance, a uh, lot of priorities related to uplifting the population from poverty. Uh, it will be very difficult if those resources are diverted uh, to, to deal with the day-to-day -day impact of climate change. So in this sense, the year 2022 will be very important uh, to, to, to prepare the to prepare the implementation plan of all the targets that are mentioned in the NDC that relates to electric mobility, that relates to promotion of electric cooking throughout the country, uh, maintaining 45% of the forest, uh, and, 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 and as well as a lot of other uh, policy targets that the country has implemented. On the adaptation front, uh, the country have recently submitted national adaptation plan so that implementation will remain key and, and the year 2022 will be again very important to prepare the full implementation plan for this uh, plan that has been submitted to the international community. Um, Nepal has also recently uh, presented the target that by 2045 uh, the, the country will, will, uh, will, will achieve the net zero emission uh, which, is, uh, which, is, which is progressive in a sense. Uh, but but we but but we also believe that it will be much easier for the country like Nepal, whose economy has is not dependent much on the carbon intensive development. Uh, so so we we will not have a huge discourse in terms of just transition like many other countries, uh, which will be easier and which will be less expensive. I'm not saying it will not be expensive, but it will be less expensive compared to many other countries. Uh, just to also note that uh, the the. The Nepal is also the federal state now, and, and the much of the power has been decentralized to the province and the and the local government. Um, there are some novel initiatives that some of the local government has taken. Uh, one of the municipality nearby to the Kathmandu Valley named Dulikel has recently signed the endorsed the non-proliferation uh, fossil fuel treaty. 
uh, and, and that means that city became a first city in South Asia uh, to, to endorse this city, so which, 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 which we believe will inspire many other urban areas, many other cities uh, in, in the region. There are also many uh, other municipalities who have uh, taken a, a zero waste management approach and, 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 and a similar uh, initiative uh, that are inspiring to, to many other uh, local bodies. But having said that, uh, it doesn't mean that there are no other problems. There are uh, there are problems uh, related to, for example, the, the environment doesn't remain, environment or the climate change doesn't remain as a top priority to, ma to, to, to many of the local bodies. Uh, they see a development the way that the traditional development of construction of the road and the infrastructure is, is an indicator of development. So huge level of awareness uh, remains important. Um, so, so finally, on, on, on the note uh, that the there has been a the growing understanding that uh, the, the 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 prosperity and and the, and the climate action can go hand in hand. Uh, one of the example is that uh, we we import almost double double the amount of petroleum product compared to the total export that the country makes, uh, which is very expensive for the for the for the GDP of the country, the the, the total uh, the the resources that the country gen generates. Um, so that's the reason the the government has been uh, very progressive in terms of promoting the the, the electric mobility. Uh, and, and also a, a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of promoting the electric cooking throughout the country. Uh, and, and I think in, in all that sense, the year 2022, again, will be very important uh, to, to, to build infrastructure on this, uh, on, on, on all this front. For example, uh, if the country plan to, uh, is, is, is the country has a target to have 25% of household using uh, electric cooking uh, by, the, by the end of this decade, Many of the household, particularly in the rural area, has a low uh, has a low ampere meter uh, when they use the electricity, which will not be enough to run the the, the electric cooking. So, so those kind of uh, the infrastructure has to be developed. Uh, there has to be work to be done in terms of uh, the, the technology breakthrough. Uh, in, in, in many sense, the subsidy that needs to be provided. Uh, very recently, just a couple of weeks earlier, the, the electricity, electricity bill has been reduced to support all this front. Uh, the, the electricity used for the, the charging station has been reduced. And, 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 uh, and, and also one of, the, one of the example that in terms of the electric vehicle, uh, the country charges around 270% of tax to the fossil fuel vehicle. Uh, whereas the electric vehicle uh, uh, only has to pay around 70 to 80 percent tax. So, so this is there uh, much ahead before we enter to the discourse of, of climate action. Um, so on the, on, on the final note, uh, the year 22, 2022 will again be very important in a sense that uh, there will be, uh, the, so there will be, a, so 2022 is also the year for the election of the local bodies. We have uh, 753 local bodies who has uh, a, a lot of decentralized power uh, on, on, on many of the fronts, uh, and all, including uh, implementation, planning and implementation of adaptation related projects. Uh, so uh, yes, uh, climate change is not a top in, in, the, in the political agenda, uh, but, but the way that the impacts are growing, the way the level of awareness is growing in terms of how the climate action and the economic prosperity can go hand in hand. Uh, I think this, 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 will, this will be very important uh, in a sense uh, how the, the political awareness uh, can be grown uh, throughout the country. Uh, but just to conclude, in terms of the, the political commitment, we haven't seen uh, 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 differences uh, among the political parties in terms of implementing climate action. Uh, that may be also because this is not top in the agenda. This is not the political fight. Uh, but but it's also positive in a sense that uh, that, uh, that there is a there is a common agreement. So hope that that uh, that any changes uh, in, in the political uh, architecture will, will not have much uh, difference uh, in this system. Um, so that's that's where we are. So so as I said, just to summarize on, on many fronts, including the work that relates to the, uh, the planning for the graduation of the country, uh, implement planning and implementation of the climate action agenda, and, and, and many work that needs to be done in terms of the political awareness and political commitments of the year 2022 will be very important for Nepal. Thank you. Thank you, Manjit. That was very useful. That was really very useful. We are, we are going to move to a country which 
now may have to rethink its energy plan altogether with the with china saying it is going to stop funding coal projects abroad so we are going to move to pakistan uh, and uh, i'm going to ask sara hayat who is a well known author on the subject and a consultant on this subject hmm, to tell us that what is pakistan planning to do in 2022 there is there we hear a lot about the 10 billion trees tsunami we hear a lot about no more coal plants so in the coming year what exactly is going to happen hi good afternoon uh, thank you for having me um right so pakistan is taken on a, an ambitious pledge uh, with climate change uh, we've just submitted our revised ndcs and um although we're not shifting to carbon neutrality which in um i think is not like i'm glad that the government didn't sort of say it's going to when it's not going to so it's it's a good thing really that they uh, haven't made an impossible uh, pledge on that count but we are planning to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by about by about 50% by 2030 15% of these of these 50% are going to be through our internal Uh, efforts and 35% of the emission reduction is contingent upon international funding um but we are at this point riding the wave of our ndc document so um with regards to climate action and the implementation of the ndc we've really sort of taken it head on uh, uh the government itself is organizing and hosting workshops across different cities in the country uh and they're inviting civil society uh members also those working in this area alongside government officials um the idea is for pakistan the idea is to like most other developing countries to focus more on the adaptation side of things and to uh in in the future have a more um sort of transparent mechanism <clears throat> regards uh, climate action excuse me <laughs> the seasonal flu has got on all of us in in lahore um right so we've got workshops that the government is uh, hosting and inviting then um the ndc document itself is being translated into local languages which is a great step uh, for us because um there is a huge disconnect between the with the, between the federation between islamabad and the actual areas where you see climate impact changing lives so the idea is to tell, to translate the ndc document into provincial languages for it to have impact or in 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 localized regions and i'll just get to the uh, provincial uh, aspect of things um apart from that in the short term the government hopes to we're, we're looking to shift towards renewable energy about 60% by 2030 uh, there there are there is a moratorium on no new uh, coal power plants um and no coal uh, no energy generation through imported coal uh pakistan hasn't as yet let go of coal uh, power production but they do intend to uh, we do intend to and there's a strong pledge in this regard uh till then we're shifting towards solar and uh, we should be hoping to prioritize solar and hydro electric power generation um we are also very strongly uh, focusing on the renew on the uh, electric vehicles policy or the government the federal government is the idea is to shift um about 30% of electric vehicles to uh, um, to electric vehicles by 2030 as well uh pakistan is revising its i uh, know it's it's preparing its uh, national adaptation plan and this time it's going to be more it's going to be gender sensitive there's going to be focus on youth involvement um so that's a that's a big leap forward for us uh, and uh, really we credit must be given where it's due uh, then of course the 10 billion tree tsunami has been making waves internationally also for pakistan the government is focused on it it is channeling uh, its funding towards it uh, and i think intends to keep the momentum going in this regard um one would hope that there's more focus on the mitigation side of things as well uh but when you speak to the government and after this ndc document i think 
Um, they've revived their climate ambition this, uh, um, uh, this year at least, and uh, hope to actually sort of meet their pledges. Um, apart from that, um, I think I can now move a little towards the uh, provision. So for Pakistan, climate change in, in the regard, in as much as it overlaps with localized impacts or environmental impacts has become, or is a devolved subject to the provinces. Um, so what happens, so what happens is uh, um, that each province will cater to its own climate impacts by and large. So the southern province or the coastal province of Sindh is looking at the coastal belt and there's quite a lot of work being done, mostly adaptation centric. Then in the northern province, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, there's, fo there's focus on GLOFs, glacial lake outburst floods. Um, so in small pockets, work is being done. Uh, I, I do feel like there needs to be some uh, so and, and then in the and then for Punjab, which is the most populated province, the government has taken smog as its uh, uh, as its Achilles heel at this point. Um, so Spark Lahore is is uh, is often on the most polluted uh, uh, list of cities even with the worst air quality. And for um, that the government is looking at giving subsidies to farmers so they don't, uh, in, in terms of harvesters and machinery, so they don't burn crops. Uh, there's been a mass movement to shift brick kilns that towards zigzag technology. So there is less emission or, you know, sort of there's more um, buffered emission of greenhouse gases. Um, there is uh, now on Mondays, uh, schools and offices, private offices are closed to reduce vehicles on the road. We're shifting to Euro 5 uh, so that the fuel quality improves. Small, small measures that really must be taken into account. Whether they come together neatly, holistically, I think is contingent of in large measure upon um, whether there is enough climate awareness. And I do, as a climate activist and advocate, always reiterate the need for climate awareness because um, globally, not just in the developed world, I feel policies lose the kind of impact they can have if awareness isn't generated. For Pakistan, climate awareness is not something that the government takes head on. Uh, it's more, it's devolved more towards or delegated towards the civil society, NGOs. Um, so, so like, for example, like, you know, in a private capacity, you raise a, a lot of climate awareness uh, and that triggers climate action then, of course. Um, and um, then on the other side, uh, the government is very much working in collaboration with international organizations, international development organizations, the UN, the World Bank, they're investing heavily in Pakistan in the sphere of climate change. Um, and they're taking on experts in this area to help them with policies. Uh, which is a good thing. I think the government is benefiting from it and together the partnership is really sort of assisting things in moving forward. Um, there is also now a lot of focus on um, injecting climate change into the school level curriculum, both privately and uh, in public schools. Uh, perhaps not as sharply as one would want, but definitely the idea is that students become more aware of uh, climate change and how it's going to be impacting us. Um, yeah, so I think overall, I'd say that the country, that, that Pakistan itself, and give, you know, given our other um, 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 the strains on, our, on, on, the, on, the, on the country in terms of the econo economy and the post-pandemic effects and uh, a very large population uh, that isn't very educated. Um, so the so making climate change a priority has really become has been a big thing for this government, and uh, they're doing they're doing what they can, and they can benefit from guidance. But um, I think they're still on the right path. Thank you, thank you, thanks a lot, Sarah. Uh, and I can see that there are lots of, for all my colleagues in the audience who are journalists, I can see lots of story ideas. I'm, I'm going to move to a new set of possible story ideas because this is something on which many of us do not write half as much as we should, which is land use change as a mitigation measure. And what better country to look at for that and who better to tell us than Agus Sari, 
the head of landscape indonesia agus over to you to tell us what indonesia is planning next year because in its indonesia is probably one of the most important countries in the world in terms of mitigation through land use change yeah uh thank you um chedit um and i'm very very happy to be here to see all um you know all the new friends especially um um old friends ati in ulka and everybody uh, um, uh i remember 20 years ago when i used to be um uh you know i think the first uh, coordinator of climate action network for southeast asia that was uh about 20 years ago wow <laughs> so long time ago okay let's let, let me start it with indonesia um of course you know covid has taken a significant toll on um, everybody's economy including indonesia and you know the the president has already said that um uh, probably uh, the world is um undergoing um uh, uh what is it what is called you know basically a great reset um uh, similar with what the world economic forum would say um that uh you know it's it's almost like a computer that um that's you know that 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 that, that freezes and needs to be basically resetted and that's that's what um, he always says uh what needs to be done is basically uh, uh, uh what is called the green green recovery and the green recovery has become a uh, you know uh, uh, um, a narrative that a lot of people started talking about how can we look at the you know the, the recovery from covid from the recession that comes with it uh into a new um a new economy that is more uh low carbon um and um you know um, a lot of think tanks in, including ours um have uh, published um uh, analysis on how to do that uh we've been um collaborating for example with the ministry of uh, national development planning that uh, uh we could actually make use of the uh the recovery um uh, momentum as a way to jump start um a lot of um a lot of uh, policies towards uh, low carbon economy and that is probably what uh, climate policy in Indonesia in 2022 is going to be uh, 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 like uh, looking at how you know basically green recovery would be would be uh, applied and implemented and as you probably have um, uh, read um, uh, in the news that there have been quite quite a number of uh, climate related disasters in indonesia and especially floods um uh, you know floods have you know been in and out of the country for 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 a long time of course you know like in many other developing countries but this year is especially important because they seem to be happening everywhere at the same time and that is very very uh you know very um difficult to um uh, uh, to comprehend yeah um, um so the president has already acknowledged that you know there's ecological disturbances of course being the cause um uh, of, of of the floods and um, his um uh, noted that you know some ecological disturbances that um you know that 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 um uh, uh, uh vegetative covers have been um uh, thinning in the uh, you know in the um uh, water catchment areas but also he noted that the um uh, the intensity of 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 rain um fall is uh, exceptionally high you know uh, in one day the the amount of water that got poured um you know from the sky is probably very uh, you know um uh, about the same or similar amount as you know several months of rain uh, rainfall um altogether and you know that has increased um uh, uh, quite a lot of uh, a lot of um um 
you know, uh, uh, at least discourses yeah, uh, among the public that yes, climate change is happening and everything. And that has helped quite a lot of, uh, of, 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 of uh, you know, um, uh, getting the awareness um, um, high. Um, so uh, let me let me talk a little bit more before we go uh, straight into forestry and land use. Uh, JT is that we we used to have um, uh, you know we um, or we do have um, uh, quite uh, quite a strong NDC yeah, nationally the uh, nationally determined contribution. Um, it used to be said that um, our NDC is twenty nine percent from the business as usual uh, with own. Um, uh, resources by 2030 and up to 41 percent um, with uh, international assistance. And the original NDC shows uh, between two, uh, you know basically uh, up to 41 percent was uh, about 38 percent between 38 and 39 percent. But I think this year our updated NDC shows exactly 41 percent. So we increased it a little bit. And we've um, actually put together quite a detailed roadmap on how to get there uh, from uh, from where we are now. Um, so that basically um, uh, uh, means that from uh, about 2.8 gigatons of um, of of, of uh, carbon dioxide equivalent emissions by 2030 in our business as usual uh, scenario, we've we have to uh, to limit it to about two uh, gigaton, you know, two mil uh, two billion tons of um, uh, emissions of uh, carbon dioxide equivalent um, uh, with own resources, and uh, reduced it uh, even further to one point eight gigatons with uh, international. Um, assistance. So, in many ways, we um, uh, we are going to do quite a lot with own resources um, and a little bit more with international um, uh, assistance. Um, uh, a lot of um, a lot of um, um, uh, budget has already been actually um, uh, spent, and I think uh, in 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 average. Um, somewhere between 800 and 900 million dollars per year that we've uh, spent on, on on climate change, and that's based on the budget tagging that the Ministry of Finance has uh, uh, done, uh, basically you know tracking um, uh, out of out of the national budget how much that would go towards um, towards climate change. Um, we do have um, a net zero um, emission target by 2060 or earlier, and that's probably, that's similar with um, uh, what has been committed by China, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so um, the commitment basically says that, um, that we will achieve it by 2060, and if with uh, if the world thinks that we should um, we should uh, go earlier, then we would welcome. Uh, assistance to 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 get there earlier, and uh, we have done quite a number of um, assessments um, that shows um, actually net zero um, uh, emission does bring quite positive um, uh, economic um, implications. It increases growth. It's um, uh, you know it reduces. Uh, 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 basically, um, secondary um, externality uh, related expenses like um, air pollution and many others. So um, that is actually uh, something that is welcome by quite a lot of um, a lot of um, uh, uh, stakeholders in Indonesia. Forestry is especially um, uh, commendable. I would say um, it's. Its um, target, its commitment in our NDC is uh, quite ambitious. 70% uh, reduction of emission by uh, from from business as usual by 2030, all the way to 90% um, of uh, emission reduction uh, by 2030 uh, with um, uh, international assistance. Um, and that is basically um, a commendable reduction from about 600 
ish, yeah, 650, I think, ish, um, uh, million tons of emissions by 2030, or yeah, by 2030, uh, uh, to about 65 only uh, million tons by tw uh, 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 and that's just, you know for 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 a country that um, um, that um, um, has its economy quite dependent on 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 extracting uh, forestry uh, products that is um, I think um, uh, quite a quite a commendable commitment. And also, um, Indonesia has uh, committed to uh, uh, making uh, our forestry sector to be uh, entirely net sink by 2030. So we are going to zero um, our, our uh, land-based emissions by 2030 and continue on making it net sink, basically. So a negative emissions beyond 2030. Um, so that's 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 that that's where we are in terms of commitments. What's going to happen next year? What's going to happen in 2022? Uh, first is that Indonesia chairs G20. G20 is um, you know 20 um, um, uh, largest economies in the world, and I think the chair, the chairship of Indonesia. Um, uh, creates additional pressure even domestically that Indonesia needs to perform uh, um, uh, on all of its um, uh, commitments and starts showing progress uh, even next year. Um, so uh, first, of course, is the, the policy to achieve NDCs and um, how it's implemented. Uh, we know that 2022 is also the time when uh, our ambitions are going to be uh, reviewed um, uh, globally uh, with, a, with, with a view of, um, of course, um, strengthening it, enhancing it. Um, that was one of the, one of the uh, uh, decisions of uh, COP26 in Glasgow just uh, recently. So um, uh, we are preparing ourselves in uh, basically looking at what else that we can do to enhance our ambition. Uh, we have actually put together quite a quite an innovative carbon uh, pricing policy um, that is also going to start being implemented next year. Uh, we already have carbon tax now um, uh, ingrained in, uh, in 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 one of our laws. Yet just just got uh, passed um, uh, uh, this year, quite recently, but a couple of months ago. Um, it's not much, about two dollars per ton. Uh, but um, uh, what it says is that that's the minimum. Uh, what it is that is that it in, uh, it depends on the price of carbon in the market. We haven't decided which market that we're going to use as a reference, but um, the tax needs to be at least at the level of the market, if not more. So that's um, you know that's that that's quite um, uh, quite um, heartening, I would say. And on top of the tax, there are also levies and, of course, trading. So those um, uh, tax levies, trading, um, they make up uh, our carbon pricing uh, policy. And, uh, you know, from, from, from non uh, earlier this year to, you know, um, having quite, uh, quite a complete um, set of policies on carbon pricing is, uh, is, is, is interesting, really. Um, uh, it's going to... Uh, Start with coal power plants. So both tax and um, trading, uh, carbon trading, will get started uh, with coal power plants as the first uh, sort of you know industry, as the first the first entities uh, to be tried on. Um, so the, we already have a presidential regulation just before the president went to the G20 summit and continued on to, uh, to Glasgow. He's just a couple of days prior, he just signed a regulation basically on what is called the, the uh, valuation of the economic valuation of carbon. Uh, which is a presidential regulation on, you know, uh, to regulate the the carbon pricing. Um, uh, that's 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 um, uh, I think is uh, quite an advanced um, advanced uh, policy. 
Um, let, let me talk a little bit more about uh, uh, the, um, the, the sector's energy and then forestry and then how the private sector would, uh, would um, uh, 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 be involved. Um, our energy sector is the most difficult, I would say, the most difficult uh, sector to, uh, uh, to, to, to deal with uh, because we are basically, you know, uh, 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 very, very coal intensive. 66% per, almost, uh, you know, about two thirds of our, our um, electricity generation comes from coal and probably additional, um, I would say 30%. Um, uh, for, uh, or even less, um, a little bit less uh, from oil and just a, a very, very tiny 10% from uh, renewable. And that needs to be increased. We have a target of increasing the portion of renewable energy in our um, energy mix uh, uh, to 23% by 2025 and 31% by 2050. Uh, it doesn't sound much uh, until you see where we are right now, right? Um, we're about 10, 11 percent right now. So 23 is basically doubling the portion of uh, renewable energy in only four years. And that's a challenge. And that's exactly why um, the president actually has asked um, you know, in, 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 in the first uh, cabinet meeting, just when he arrived in Indonesia from uh, Glasgow to basically to, uh, for everybody to work on uh, 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 laying out a roadmap for energy transition as soon as possible and get the roadmap be done before the, the G20 meeting. Um, he, he's made it. Uh, sound that we are in an urgent need of a good energy transition plan. Um, he's talked to uh, two of, of our largest um, uh, 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 energy, state-owned energy companies, you know, the, the oil company and the, the, the electricity company to basically think about leaving coal leaving uh, uh, um, uh, carbon intensive uh, technologies, carbon intensive energies and embrace um, renewable as much and as basically as, as big, you know, um, uh, um, uh, a plan as possible. And um, he even just, um, uh, 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 you know, uh, asked to replace the CEO of the uh, of the electricity company and um, installed a new one. So that's that's where we are with the energy sector. Um, uh, the question, of course, is then what to do with the oil industry because you know um, oil also, uh, continues to be a major a major sector in Indonesia and uh, the dual mandate of increasing production and re reducing emission doesn't seem to you know, to, 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 to go well together. Now, the forestry sector is, of course, uh, like you say, Jardim, is uh, uh, where um, um, it gets interesting. We have uh, reduced our, 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 our deforestation rate quite significantly. Indonesia used to be basically the worst deforester in the world. We um, uh, not even not even ten years ago, yeah, uh, we were number one in the world when it comes to uh, deforestation. Uh, but since then, we reduced our our deforestation rate by ninety percent. Um, so you know, uh, from from a staggering more than a million hectares per year. Deforestation rate, we reduced it to about, you know, uh, I think 111 uh, 11 or 120 or something like that, uh, 1,000 hectares per year. It's still a lot. It's still a lot. It's twice as big as the city of Jakarta, which is a big city. But, you know, the, I think the, 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 the uh, trend is, um, is, 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 you know, is, is, is um, commendable. Uh, and then um, uh, we all, we still have um, you know um, a uh, presidential regulation that that permanently protects 
66 million hectares of primary forests. And that's um, actually that's that came out of um, you know uh, the policy to uh, do a moratorium of um, of of, of uh, falling of um, uh, primary forests in 2011. I think it started in 2011, and for you know, and every two years after that, you know, 11, 13, 15, 17, it has gotten uh, extended all the time, and then by 20. The 19, I remember, then basically uh, the president decided, let's not do a moratorium, let's do it permanently. So we are, we have a, a presidential regulation to permanently um, uh, uh, protect uh, the remaining, we call it the remaining um, uh, uh, primary forests in Indonesia. Um, and then um, uh, palm oil remains a challenge. Of course, uh, Indonesia is the largest palm oil uh, uh, producer in the world. Uh, um, uh, we used to have a moratorium of expansion of palm oil plantation until, until probably about a couple of months, three months ago. Um, uh, and then the president decided not to uh, extend it although the Minister of Environment and Forestry uh, uh, immediately said that uh, she is not going to give any, any, any permit uh, for a uh, conversion of forests into palm oil uh, plantation. I think that's, that's, that's positive, but um, you know, not all lands are uh, under the, um, the authority of the Ministry of um, Environment and Forestry and that that remains a challenge indeed. Quite a number of private sector uh, uh, companies, corporations have embraced net zero uh, targets, interestingly enough, you know. Um, I think uh, climate change and emission reduction and net zero has become a token um, of, 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 of association, I would say, by, by the, the corporations right now in Indonesia. They are, trying to outdo each other in um, in their net zero commitments you know and but quite a lot of them actually have the commitments to to reach net zero between 2030 and 2050 and that's also something that uh, that is that's quite exciting of course I'm net zero sorry. it's not necessarily zero um, I'm, I'm, very sorry. I, I'm very sorry i i, I hate to interrupt this because it's very, very interesting, but uh, I'm getting requests from journalists saying that it's getting very close to their deadline now. Uh, uh, so if you could just, uh, you know, sum up in a, maybe yeah, in a yeah. sentence or two. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. yeah. I, I, it was actually my my, my, my closing uh, uh, remarks to that, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, the role of private sector in uh, getting uh, uh, net zero. So that's, that's, that's where we are now. Um, and uh, net zero is not necessarily zero, so they will need to offset their emissions from elsewhere, domestically and internationally, but that's where we are. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you very much. Thank you, Agus. Thanks a lot. I can see lots of stories coming out of this. Uh, my apologies to Ulka. I, I'm very sorry to make you wait for so long, but I'm sure you realize why. Uh, uh, I, because India is the elephant in this virtual room uh, with its huge uh, uh, issues of both mitigation and adaptation, not to talk of loss and damage. Uh, now, we have a situation in India where the Prime Minister Narendra Modi uh, came up with a plan from between now and 2030 uh, at the Glasgow summit. So now the question becomes, what of that plan, anything of that plan that will actually happen on the ground in in the coming year 2022 thanks joydeep and thanks to third pole uh, it's been really a rich sharing of experiences from across this region so i've certainly learned a lot and i want to kind of start with that point the need for learning and cooperation in this year in this year 2022 and I want to give four examples, really, of you know, how we can learn from each other. And I've heard many of you, many of my fellow panelists speak about this. First, you know, this whole plan that you spoke about, which the building block of it is more renewable energy. 
you can't use that renewable energy unless you're able to store it, distribute it. Otherwise, you, you keep falling back on your fossil-based power. Uh, we always talk about battery storage in this context, but even more important is this issue of a regional energy grid, a regional electricity grid. It's really going to be quite a key to unlocking the potential of RE and using it, uh, to, you know, actually doing more than building capacity, but actually generating that electricity and using it. So I think for all the countries in the region, especially those that are blessed with solar power, um, I think the regional electricity grid is going, should be quite a focus in 2022. Uh, the second issue, which again, many countries from, you know, from Central Asia onwards are mentioned is just transition. And it plays out differently in our part of the world than how it was first envisaged in say the coal mines of Poland or the Appalachian mountains of the US. In our country, we, um, we have issues where livelihoods have traditionally been linked for generations with caste. We have much limited mobility. We have much limited uh, literacy levels and you know, ability to skill up. We have major issues when it comes to women in the workforce and the social issues around that. So just transition in countries like India is far more complicated, far more informal, far more social than you know, the examples that we have from, from other parts of the world. And so we'll have to come up with our own unique, uh, you know, customized in some sense, um, uh, solutions to just transition and we'll have a lot to learn from each other in this region. The third is to learn from our own failures. I mean, I've been very struck by this example that we've had recently in Sri Lanka, one of the pioneers of organic farming, which has had to roll back this policy of banning imports of chemical fertilizers because it's leading to widespread, um, I would say even hunger, uh, food price inflation. Uh, so we have in many cases, in this region stepped up ahead of where we are and we've had to uh, you know, learn from uh, failed experiments. So I think uh, there again, there's a lot that in 2022, we need to learn from you know, recent examples. And the fourth, I would say from countries like Bangladesh and Nepal, I think local planning is something that has always been at the heart of you know, adaptation planning in these countries. And countries like India need to learn from that, even though we are, as you said, you know, large like an elephant, um, we do need to learn because, you know, when it comes to climate action that will happen at this massive scale uh, at which we are planning it, it's bound to have positive macroeconomic impacts in the aggregate. It's bound to have positive, you know, when you have more investment, you have, you know, you create more jobs, more GDP, our models show that. It will be a positive story. But at the local level, given the scale of this intervention, it is also very likely that it might have maladaptive local impacts on livelihoods, especially land-based livelihoods, nature-based livelihoods. And so we need checks and balances. We need processes, institutional, uh, local participatory processes in order to prevent maladaptive inadvertent consequences of this mitigation. So I'll just start uh, you know, with sort of saying how important it will be to learn from each other and to cooperate with each other. Uh, in terms of just a few additional points, I think I would uh, echo Argus's point about the G20 presidency. Just after Indonesia is the president of the G20 in 2022, India takes over in 2023. So certainly we would also have to prepare and work together. We all, you know, G20 has this concept of a troika, which has the outgoing presidency, the current presidency, and the future presidency. So certainly a lot that can be done over there to prepare. The important thing in India and here, you know, I'd sort of echo Sara, where again here we in India we the subnational provincial governments play a very important role. And you know, uh, Mumbai, for example, is a city that has already got a climate action plan underway, um, looking ahead at a kind of carbon neutral future. A Bihar as a state is stepping up and saying we would like to have a low carbon development pathway. And and it's very interesting for the city, which is like the commercial capital of, uh, of India, Mumbai, probably the highest carbon footprint, and a state like Bihar, which is probably one of the lowest carbon footprint regions of the state, you know, where there's hardly any industry, mostly it is agriculture, uh, for, you know, this ex entire spectrum of, uh, of you know, uh, carbon neutral experiments, carbon neutral plans being made, there is no template, these are going to be the first of their type, uh, no role models, but they can share with others 
about how to go about doing this, how, uh, you know, how they're making and, and what the national government can do is foster open discussion, uh, foster peer to peer sharing of, ex, uh, you know, of experiences and learning from each other, so that we can mainstream climate considerations into uh, state action plans on climate change, for example, and, and others. Uh, the third uh, sort of very important um, role that government will have to play is that in order to um, to make sure that you know you know when you said all these targets are there, what will happen? Actually, what will happen on the ground will be industry responding. Industry will you know put in place the investments for renewable energy, start you know putting in place the supply chains for green hydrogen, start trading and maintaining their competitiveness in a way that they don't lose out to say the European carbon border adjustment mechanism. So industry will lead. What government will have to do is two things. One, put in place the regulatory certainty for industry. That is a long-term signal for industry that this is the direction of travel. We will have more renewable energy mandates, electric vehicle sales mandates, green hydrogen use mandates, energy efficiency, material efficiency mandates. Those are the kinds of signals that government would need to give. And I would in fact add to that a carbon tax as well. Uh, the second is the role of a risk guarantor and a demand aggregator. Because you know, the scale at which we are talking about these, um, you know, these 2030 targets and more needs to happen for 2070, market forces alone will not actually get us there. Um, even though RE is becoming more competitive compared to coal, coal, in a country like India, and I would say for this entire densely populated region, land is going to be a big constraint. Mineral security for battery storage is going to be a big constraint. Uh, finance, of course, is going to be a big constraint. So the role of government is going to be to guarantee risks, to um, aggregate demand, and to prevent really the kinds of policies where we've had power purchase agreements rolled back so that industry you know, takes two steps forward and one step back. That is really something that will have to happen in 2022, a kind of um, confirmation of the direction of travel and laying the foundations um, you know, with the entire region learning from each other. So let me just stop there and uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much, Ulka. Well, that was succinct, but uh, that was, I think, gave a lot of scope for thought. Thank you. I realized that I re a few minutes ago that we have crossed the 90 minute mark. I'm very sorry about this, but it was so interesting. I mean, uh, that I was completely loath to, you know, stop anybody or interrupt any, any of these things. So since we have crossed the 90 minute mark, there is one common question for one panelists or uh, for all panelists to which I will request you to respond in one sentence each, if possible. That common question is that to what extent should the industrialized countries help us? All of you talked about the need for financial support. So the question actually puts the same thing more strongly. To what extent do the industrialized countries owe it to developing countries to help in this transition that we are talking about? May I ask you first, Sarah? Absolutely, thank you. So in one sentence, uh, the developed world really owes it to the developing world to help them to help us in this transition through uh, finances, through technology transfer, like you identified, through expertise, through even raising capacity to deal with climate change uh, for locals here and um, to identify localized problems in areas and help deal with those like smog for Pakistan or and for Lahore and Delhi um, or crop burning. And so um, basically focusing on helping on specific areas instead of helping generally. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Manjit, your turn. Yeah, thank you. I think it's it's clear, uh, even if we look at the Paris Agreement, the developed country has to take a lead uh, where uh, all the other also has a, 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 a responsibility to, to, to the certain extent um, in terms of the principle that has really agreed. We all are of the same board. Uh, so yes, I think there are there are there are obligations of the developed countries, which we, we all agree. 
uh, which has not been fulfilled in many cases, which has been in progress in many cases. Uh, but we all are on the same board. Uh, the delay in climate action will hamper all of us. So the, the climate action is urgent. Thank, thank you, Manjit. Ulka, now India is in a sort of a middle position, right? As an emerging economy. Uh, so what? how would you respond to this question? Yeah, I'm usually very optimistic. Manjit has been on panels with me when I'm saying very really sort of rosy picture kind of things. But uh, if the question is, what does the West uh, or the Global North owe us? Yes, of course, they owe us. What will they deliver or what we should expect? Nothing. Uh, basically, the uh, models of the business models or the technological models of the West are quite irrelevant, whether it is for the country in the middle, as you said, like India, or for countries which are you know, further down in the development pathway. We're not talking about decarbonizing existing fossil fuel infrastructure. We're talking about meeting the unmet energy needs of our people by creating new clean energy infrastructure and creating new livelihoods based around uh, nature-based solutions or clean energy. There are no role models for it. There is no technology that you know, we cannot get on commercial terms. Uh, technology charity is out of the question. We've seen vaccine inequity issues this whole year. And if you know, uh, so yeah, I'm in a very sort of negative frame of mind today. But I would say that you know, uh, there's nothing that uh, that we should depend on for you know for coming from the West. Uh, we have to find our own solutions, whether they are business models or whether they are technologies that are affordable for, for our part of the world. Thanks. That, that's all, that's also an exciting new paradigm. I think. Agus, how would you respond? Yeah, I think, uh, uh, well, developing countries are in a very different level of um, uh, economic development and uh, emissions. And as such, we don't need to follow um, exactly behind the, the industrialized countries. We, we, we can, um, I love we can do it our own way, and as such, we can avoid our, uh, 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 a high carbon future. We can go directly into a low carbon future, uh, uh, doing it our own way. And I agree. I think it is not about uh, 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 increasing consumptions per se that we need. Is uh, but it is actually providing uh, necessities to uh, those that are currently uh, uh, in need for it, and uh, we can do it in a low carbon. Uh, uh, way already. Um, I think that's one. Second is um, um, uh, most um, most of um, the uh, climate actions um, do have local benefits, and as such, you know, do it with or without developing countries telling us what to do, with or without the, whether developing countries will give us money. So um, uh, uh, we need to be able to do it our, um, our, uh, ourselves because it, the benefit. Uh, comes to us anyway. That said, of course, you know, uh, industrial countries do have um, the obligations to uh, to to assist, especially the 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 weakest of us, yeah, the the, the small islands, the uh, you know underdeveloped and uh, you know poor countries that um, have very 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 dire. Uh, uh, um, you know, uh, situation uh, with regards to the impact of climate change, and they need help. And I think uh, we need to see that hundred billion dollars that they are uh, they, they 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 said, uh, you know, more than ten years ago that is supposed to be there, but is not. And I think um, that's mm -hmm. mostly that's what it is for. Thank you very much, Joy Deep, and I Thank enjoyed you. this uh, conversation a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to a lot to all our panelists. Thanks a lot to all our audience members. I'm sure all of us got a lot of score, uh, food for thought. I'm sure all of us who are journalists got a lot of story ideas. I'm looking forward to seeing all these stories. The um, presentation made by Ola will be shared with all of you. Don't worry about it. And we shall also share this entire recording. Thank you very much and bye and have a good day. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye everybody. Really nice bye. to see you all. Bye.